Dear Father in heaven, we come before you in Jesus' name. And we thank you for your kindness and mercy towards us through the Lord Jesus Christ. We are so thankful uh, that we have an anchor. Lord, we, we're so thankful that we have a sure hope, a steadfast hope. We do pray tonight that you would please uh, just bless us as we open up your word and we, we talk about that very thing, Lord. And I pray that you'd help us to have it real in our hearts. And God, that we really would be able to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because of your promises that you've made to us. Lord, I pray for Miss Tara, and God, uh, you you are aware, and uh, you understand, and I'm thankful that you ever lived to make intercession, and so I pray for her, and God, would you please touch her family, you know exactly what they need, and I pray, God, that you would give them uh, just that. I pray for the Neely family, and Lord, I, I understand there's some very difficult things that have taken place there, and we, we do pray for them and that young man, and and Lord, we pray, Father, that you'd help Miss Jeanette to be a, a light to them. And, and Lord, we, we pray, Father, that uh, your will would be accomplished. We, we, we're thankful for the, uh, the, the life and testimony of Miss Candy Richmond, Lord. And we sure miss her around here. And we hate to hear that she's not doing well. And we pray, Father, she's on hospice care. We know that uh, you, you decide when life is over, not man. And I do pray, God, that uh, your will would be accomplished in her and, Lord, that you would allow these people who are uh, taking care of her um, to do a good job. And, and, Lord, we pray for healing and uh, that you would allow her daughters uh, just to draw close to her during this time. Pray for Miss Lorraine Richardson uh, going into the hospital. And we do ask, God, that you'd please minister to her and help her with what she uh, has going on in her body. We do pray for Brother Alvis, Lord, help him as he's there. Uh, to minister to his wife and God that you give them um, some information that they need to determine what's going on. Lord, we pray for Miss Christina's sister. We're thankful for the good trip that she was able to make it there and back. We thank you for answering our prayers concerning those things. And uh, we're thankful to hear uh, the good report uh, of Miss Christina's sister doing better than what she expected. And we pray you continue to uh, increase her recovery and the Lord that her strength would grow. We do pray for those uh, uh, that are in authority, Lord, that we might live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And Lord, where we have opportunity, we pray you'd help us to take it, um, to uh, make an impact in the way that our laws are set and the officers and, and, and people, who, the officials who hold those offices, um, Lord, uh, would uh, be, be the right ones. Help us, Lord, to make the right decisions concerning those things. Uh, we pray for uh, Miss Amber. Lord, and her spiritual condition, and we pray, Father, for her family, and, and Lord, we do ask God to uh, touch her body physically as well, and uh, Lord, I pray you just be with Miss Lisa as she's been steadfast and faithful to pray and, and to intercede for her daughter, and we do ask God that you'd give her uh, peace concerning that matter, and uh, help her, Lord, just to continue to, to witness and minister to her in the way in which you'd be most pleased. Lord, I pray for uh, my mother tonight. God, would you help her concerning the things regarding her household? And uh, Lord, we pray for uh, the direction for these children. And uh, we, we ask, Lord, that you'd touch their souls, touch their hearts. So thankful to have them here tonight. And uh, Lord, we, we pray, Father, that the word of God would uh, be buried deep in their hearts and that it would not return void. And uh, Lord, we pray uh, some of these kids, Lord, here tonight, uh, if they're not saved already, Lord, that they would get saved. And Lord, we pray for uh, the Word of God to go forth. We are thankful, Lord, for your uh, will in our lives. And we, we just ask, Lord, you continue to minister to us. We ask for uh, uh, Miss Natasha and, and Hector in the circumstance that they're in, uh, having to move and, and being uh, what, a, what appears to be destitute at this time. And we pray that you provide for their needs. And God, would you uh, help them to uh, get a place of residence as well. And I pray for Miss Amanda and... Uh, uh, Mr. Powell's family during this time of year, Lord, would you just give them strength and grace uh, to get through this time of uh, difficulty, Lord. I pray you'd comfort them by the power of the Holy Ghost. Lord, I pray for this unspoken request uh, for Miss Sherry, God, you know what she needs, and I pray you'd supply it. And uh, Lord, we just ask that as we meet together tonight under the banner of the Bible, Lord, as we gather together to submit to the Savior, God, would you help us tonight, Lord, to love you, to care for you. And, uh, Lord, we, we pray, Father, that uh, we'd receive the word of truth. And, God, that we'd make application to our lives. We pray you'd help us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Let's take our Bibles tonight. Turn to 1 John chapter number 5. 1 John chapter number 5. 
One of my favorite verses tonight. And if you don't if you don't have this verse memorized, I encourage you to. It's a great verse to memorize. In fact, uh, the one right above it is a great verse to memorize as well. But I love these verses. I'm going to begin reading here, 1 John chapter 5, and verse number 10. We'll stop at verse number 13. The Bible says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. What a dreadful thing that would be to call God a liar. Verse number 11. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. As I said Sunday morning, it is a life or death matter. And we're not talking about temporal life, we're talking about eternal life. Verse number 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Now, we were just told in the Scripture that God has a record. And the record is concerning Jesus Christ, that He is the Son of God, and that the Son of God has life to give. And that record is in heaven and on earth. There's three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one, and there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. We talked Sunday morning about the four ways in which God has made His truth real to us. We have creation, we have our conscience, we have the commandments of God, and ultimately we have the conviction of the Spirit of the Lord. And we know if you're saved this evening, I was about to say this morning, if you're saved this evening, you have the witness of God in yourself. Now, hallelujah, isn't that good? I'm I'm thankful. But verse number 13, God goes a step further. He says, these things have I written unto you. Now, 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 hear me. God truly desires for every single person that has been born again to be confident of their relationship to God. He wants them to be sure that their sins are forgiven and that they know that they are going to heaven. See, the Lord is not holding out assurance like a carrot on a stick. Here it is for you tonight if you're saved, if you're wondering, if you're unsure. Here it is in black and white. The information you need, the concrete promise that we can know that we have Eternal life. Even even in all of our disobedience, and I'm not advocating disobedience tonight, but even in all of our disobedience, the Bible says the just man falleth seven times. He's always messing up. But God is taking the time not only to give us the inner witness, but He's taking the time to put these things in front of us in case there's ever any doubt, in case we ever get to a place that we aren't sure, in case we have grieved the Spirit of God because of sin in our life, the Lord has taken the Scriptures there. That way we can know that we know that we know that we know that we have eternal life. Isn't, isn't that a blessing tonight? Aren't you, aren't you glad? God loves you. I mean, He really he, he cares about you. You talk about, hey, he, he, wants, he wants you to have the right kind of emotional health. He wants you to have the right kind of mental health. He wants you to have the right kind of spiritual health. He's not just wanting to save you from your sin. He's wanting to help you to enjoy this life. And listen, I'm not talking about those charlatans on TV that's promised you your best life now. I'm talking about He wants you to enjoy the promises of God because all the promises of God in Christ Jesus are yea and amen. He wants you to walk in the victory that has been wrought for you. This is how we overcome the world, our victory, even our faith. He wants us to be uh, victorious in our Christian life. He doesn't want you walking around defeated. He doesn't want you concerned because you fell short of His glory today. He wants you to get up from your failure with confidence that your relationship to Him is secure and He wants you to allow that knowledge to be the encouragement you need to continue to run your race with patience. All throughout the Scriptures, not just the New Testament, but the Old Testament, God has indicated to us the permanency of our redemption. 
Now, if you were with us on Sunday in Sunday school, we, we mentioned a few of these things, and I'm just going to tell you this real quick, and then we'll jump right back in to the message. But and we looked here in Sunday school, just three different verses, two verses in John and a verse in the book of Romans, but the salvation that God has offered. John 3.16, the most famous verse that people know, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have ever lasting life. Right in the verse above that, John chapter 3 and verse number 15 says that we have eternal life. Did you know that the life that you enter into is eternal because Jesus has no ending, He has no beginning, He always is, He always will be. It's that life that you're entering into is like that stream, amen, that, that never runs dry, but the life that you have, it's everlasting. You had a starting point, but it's never going to run out. Isn't that good? Hallelujah. We can be sure that we have eternal life, that, that we have that our salvation continues. It doesn't run out. But then we noted in John 10 the security of our salvation. The Bible says that He holds us in His hand. Amen. And we shall never perish. No man is able to pluck us out of it. It's permanent. It cannot be taken away. We have security. Not only does it continue, but we have security. And the nature of the salvation that God has given to us, the Bible says in Romans chapter 6 and verse number 23, where the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is a gift. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The salvation that God offers continues forever. We have security. We have, and the nature of that salvation that God gives is a gift. So you don't have to earn it. You don't have to keep it. You don't have to try for it. You just got to believe it. Amen. Isn't that good? And he's taking the time here in verse number 13 to write it down one more time just in case you had any questions. Hallelujah. Now, there are a lot of people who... I think many of them are saved. They've just got to hold a bad doctrine. Um, but there's a lot of them, I think, that they're not saved because the object of their faith is in their self. But they, they believe that you can lose your salvation. They believe that the salvation that God has wrought for you, though He said it was eternal, it's not really. Though He said it was everlasting, it's just, but if you mess up, you lose it. Now, to me, that sounds like calling God a liar all over again, doesn't it? <laughs> because if God says it, that settles it whether you and I like it or not. But I can, if I, if I, if I think about it from a human standpoint, I can understand why many people come to the conclusion that once a person is saved, they must live a certain way to keep it. Why, why, why do people do that? It's because our, our reasoning... In our mind, it seems like this is the natural course. Why? Because it corresponds with our human interactions. You think about this. If you've got a friend or if you're married, there is a certain degree of personal righteousness you are going to have to maintain to keep that relationship working, right? Because if you're just a jerk, <laughs> if you're just taking advantage of the friend or, or taking advantage of the marriage... Uh, it's not going to work out. There, there is a certain level of abstinence of sins which must be maintained in order to keep the relationship afloat. You know what I mean? If you, if you break the marriage bonds, or if you, if you take advantage of that friend through deceit or through theft, there's going to be all types of things that can cause the relationship to cease. And so when we use our human understanding and we apply it to salvation that God has given to us, of course you would come to the conclusion that, well, there must be some condition set upon salvation. Now, I'll say this. There is a condition set upon salvation. You know what it is? You've got to believe it. I mean, Jesus died for every man. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 3, that He tasted death for every man. He's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. Now, let me just, I'm just going to back up for a second. How in the world could anybody believe that God has ordained some people to heaven and some people to hell if He says He's not willing that any should perish? Well, isn't that interesting? Uh, you know, that's what happens when you get away from the Bible and you start thinking with this mind instead of with the mind of Christ. Amen. But anyway, I digress. The, the premise, though, that this, this doctrine where you can lose your salvation, the, the premise that it's built upon is faulty. Because first of all, as I've mentioned, it relies on human reasoning. And, and the Bible says in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, 
So are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. God says, I'm not like you. I'm not an Indian giver. I don't, I don't get mad and quit because you didn't respond the way I wanted you to. He, God says, when I do something, I do it for sure. I do it forever. Amen. I'm glad God isn't like us, aren't you? <laughs> but, but ultimately, what, so, so the, the premise it's built upon is, is faulty because it's human reasoning, but ultimately it comes down to these two basic philosophies as to why people believe that we can lose our salvation. Number one, they believe that willful sin in the life of a believer will disannul their salvation or their pardon from sin. That is what you'll find. They'll say, well, if you, if you go too far, then you'll lose what God has given you. Now, you may be inclined to ask, how do they categorize which sins are willful and which sins aren't? <laughs> is there some scriptural basis for this? Well, I'm not asking you to raise your hand or to make an acknowledgement with your mouth or even nod your head, but just just consider what I'm saying tonight. What sin have you ever committed that wasn't a direct result of your own will? All sin is willful sin. It isn't a disease you catch, it's something you commit. We're all, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And you may be thinking, well, if that's the case, how do these so-called, so, uh, I almost said social security, how, how do these so-called eternal security deniers figure out which one of the sins causes your salvation to be lost? How do they do that? Well, I'll tell you, this is what they do. They choose the sins they don't struggle with, and they make that the basis of their argument. Now, isn't that convenient? Because if you talk to ten different ones, then they'll give you ten different answers. It's very funny. You know, some people say, well, if, uh, if, you, uh, you know, if, if, if you do this or you do that, or I, I don't want to break up any examples tonight, but whatever it may be, whatever comes to your mind, the biggest sin, the most horrible sin, the worst sin, uh, that's the sin they're talking about, unless they commit it. Then it's not that one, it's something else. <laughs> now, in effect, we believe in eternal security. We believe in once saved, always saved. I don't care if people don't like that phrase or not. I mean, I love it because I'm glad I'm always saved. I believe in it because the Bible says it. But what these people are saying that deny that salvation is permanent is that they're saying that our sin is more powerful than Jesus' sacrifice. That, that's what, they're saying that sin is more powerful than Jesus. Well, that, that puts us in a little bit of a conundrum, doesn't it? That kind of makes Jesus less than what the Bible makes Him out to be. The, but the Bible says here, same, same book, chapter 1, verse number 7, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from some sin. Oh, wait, that's not what it says. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. Every, how, how, anybody know what all is in the Greek? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, all I know is English, but I know what it means in English. Amen. All means all. That means every sin, all of them, every one you could think of in your mind or name off on your fingers. Every single he, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. He said in Matthew chapter twenty-six and verse number twenty-eight, "For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission." Of sins. Do you know what Jesus' blood did? He put sin into remission. Amen. And it ain't coming back. <laughs> it's not coming back. He, he took care of it once for all, finally and forever. Because his sacrifice was good enough. In fact, I, I want you to turn tonight backward with me just a little bit. We'll turn to the book of Hebrews. I want to deal with a passage tonight. And ultimately, this is one of the passages that people go to to disprove eternal security. It turns out that this passage of Scripture, this chapter actually from, from uh, cha verse number 1 all the way to verse number 39 is one of the, the best chapters to prove eternal security, but you have to take the whole chapter. You can't just isolate text uh, to make it say what you want them to say. I mean, be careful about those kind of people. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Jesus' sacrifice was enough for your sins to be taken care of. 
Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 10. I'm going to jump right in here. It says, but by the which will we are sanctified. What does that mean, sanctified? It means to be set apart, to removed from unto. And in this context, that sanctification means we're, we're removed from sin unto God. We're sanctified. How? How are we sanctified? Through the offering that we put in the box. The work that we do to keep it. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the good thoughts that we think or the deeds towards... Uh, no, that's not what... That, now, people try to put that in there. But that's not in there. It says, by the which will we are sanctified, we're set apart unto God through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. For how long? Once for... There's that word again. All, hallelujah. One time, there was one sacrifice made, and it was good enough for all sin. Amen. That kind of, we don't have to go any further than that, but we will. Verse number 11, the Bible says, And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering, oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never, never, no other sacrifice that you could possibly offer to God will take away your sins. There's only one sacrifice. There's only one thing that works, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ offering oftentimes the same sacrifice which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins for ever, hallelujah, forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Do you, if you're a student of the Word and you look at all the Old Testament priests and you see their labor and their work and all the things that they're required to do according to the Levitical law, they never get to sit down because their work is never done. But the Bible says that Jesus Christ sat down at the right hand of the Father. Why? Because He said, It is finished. He made a one-time payment and it satisfied all sin everywhere in every person. The Bible says in verse number 13, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. He's just hanging out until he goes to, into the, the victory crowd. Amen. Verse number 14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are, there's that word again, sanctified. If you're saved tonight, you have been sanctified by the body of the Lord Jesus Christ and His sacrifice was one time, it was for all sin, it's going to last forever and it says that God not only has saved us from our sin but He says He has perfected us. Look at what it says, I'll read it one more time. For by one offering He hath perfected forever the same term that He used to talk about the sacrifice for sins forever He used to determine how long we are going to be saved. It says, for what, by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. This is just getting gooder and gooder. Verse number 15. Wherefore, or excuse me, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds, and I will write them. That kind of sounds like that inward witness we talked about Sunday morning, doesn't it? Verse number 17. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Well, see, preacher, he's only talking about those sins we've committed up until that point where we got saved, because after that, he remembers all of them. Verse number 18. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. You know what that tells me? We don't have to bring another offering to go before God. Why is that? Because the offering was sufficient the first time and it's sufficient for every need and every application even on into the future. There is no sin that Christ's sacrifice has not atoned for and if a person has entered into that salvation through faith, there is a guaranteed pardon for past, present and future sins. Amen. That's good stuff. There's some dirty things and rotten things that I've done in my past. And there's some things right now I'm trying to get out of my life. And there's probably going to be, I'm going to slip up tomorrow, I'm going to mess up tomorrow, I'm going to sin tomorrow, and I'm not saying that I want to, I don't want to, because I've been born again, I've got a Spirit of God living on the inside that's helping me to live pure and holy and righteous, but I'm going to mess up anyway because I'm fallible. And God said, don't worry, I got you. I'm not going to drop you. 
I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. I'm going to continue to cleanse you by the, the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm just reminded of a verse. I'm going to read it to you in Titus chapter 3 and verse number 5. The Bible says this, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which is shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. You're thinking, oh no, I messed up today. Lord said, don't worry, I got the soul. I got the bubbles. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm going to wash you again one more time. You're going to be just as clean as you was when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ the first time. You are sanctified. You are perfected forever. And you're wondering, I'm preaching this, how did them people ever come to the conclusion that salvation wasn't permanent? I'm wondering the same thing. Must have not been reading their Bible. Must have not been studying the Word of God. Must have not been rightly dividing the Word of truth. I'm telling you, this is the solution for every question that you have in regard to God or your relationship to Him. It's the Bible. It's the Bible. Just get into it, dive in, love it, read it, uh, uh, re memorize it, put it in your heart. You won't sin against God, and you'll be able to... Those people that try to come and, and teach a false doctrine, you'll be able to know right off the cuff. Hey, you know, you're telling me this, but I don't, I've, been, I've been reading the New Testament epistles on a regular basis. I don't remember reading nothing like that in there. I don't remember reading nothing about that in there. What are you talking about? So it'll, it'll help you to keep you safe. Amen. All right. The first, the first premise that is faulty is that they believe... These people that deny eternal security, they believe that willful sin in the life of a believer will disannul their pardon. They think that sin is greater than Christ's sacrifice. Obviously, we know that's not true. I'll read it one more time. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 12 says, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. But second, they believe that personal righteousness must be maintained in order to keep salvation. They believe that, that sin is greater than Christ's sacrifice, but they also believe you've got to live to a certain standard or you lose it. Now we know what James chapter 2 and verse number 10 says, don't we? Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in, how many points? One point he is guilty of, there's his word again, all. So he's guilty of all. And the Bible done, has done said in Isaiah 64, verse number 6, all our righteousnesses are as filthy, excuse me, tonight. I apologize about that. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. So what level of righteousness must be in, maintained in order to keep your salvation? Again, is there a biblical basis for this? But what we find is if we correspond with these individuals, we come under their personal opinion and they're just trying to propagate their own philosophy. Because whatever level of righteousness they live to becomes their standard. Now I'm not super versed on these individuals and, I, and I, I've just I've, I've dealt with it very, very lightly and, and, and very, few, uh, very, very few instances, but I understand there, there's uh, the Amish people, and they, they believe you can lose your salvation. But they believe it on another level. They say, if, if you don't wear the right color shirt, if you aren't wearing, if you're a lady, if you aren't wearing a head covering, if you don't have the proper stripe on your attire, I mean, it really, it really gets down to something as fickle as that. They say that you're not, you, you lost your salvation. And you know why they make that the standard? It's because that's something that they can do. <laughs> that's something that they can keep up with. And so they make that the standard. How about this? What if, what if we made the standard, hey, always receive wrong the right way? If somebody's mean to you, if somebody insults you, don't ever respond the wrong way. What if we made that the level of righteousness? Now, how many of us are losing our salvation? <laughs> I I am. How many of them Amish people are going to use that as a level of righteousness to attain? About this many. You know why? Because the first time that they lose their temper, the first time that they say something out of the way to someone, the first time they have a sarcastic remark, their salvation is gone according to their standard. So 
So, so it's, a, it's, a faulty, it's a faulty premise. It's not biblical because sin is not greater than Christ's sacrifice. And, and our righteousness is already messed up in the first place. That's why we needed Jesus. So how in the world could we possibly keep our salvation by trying to all of a sudden be righteous? So here's, here's a novel idea. We're going to try this tonight and see how, how it happens. Let's see what the Bible says. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter number 3. Romans chapter number 3 and verse number 10. I'm going to read several verses here tonight. So bear with me. Romans chapter 10, or Romans chapter 3 and verse number 10. The Bible says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one, not even those that are saved. How about that? There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulchre. With their tongues they have used deceit. Their, the poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. It continues to go on. Verse number 20, it says, Therefore, excuse me, verse number 19, Now we know what, that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. So if you try to put yourself under a bunch of rigorous standards to keep yourself in the love of God. You know what the Bible is telling you? He said, you're just declaring your own guilt. That's all you're doing. Verse number 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. You get into the Word of God, and you see what God has written back in that Old Testament about righteousness, and you're going to learn a whole new, new, new aspect of how sinful you are. It's not going to help you be more righteous. It's just going to help you to humble yourself in the sight of the Lord that He shall lift you up. That's what, that's what the law is for. It's our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. But verse number 21, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Did you see what that said? Righteousness without the law. I don't know why I picked that up. Righteousness without the law, it says, is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God. There is a way for you to obtain not man's righteousness, not an excellent righteousness. You can obtain the righteousness of God, and it's not obtained through the law. Look what it says. Which is by faith of who? Jesus Christ unto all. It's open for everybody, and upon all them it's received by those that believe. For there's no difference. It's, it's a free way to be righteous in the sight of God. It's by faith. Just as freely as your sins can be forgiven, as, as, as how you can become righteous before God, it's the same way by believing that Jesus died for your sins and that He was buried and that He rose again the third day. Verse number 28 says this, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So, with all these things said, in context of our verse that we saw in 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 13, it says, These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. The reason that he wrote those things to you is because there's people out there trying to convince you otherwise. The reason that he wrote those things to you is because when you have those times of doubt where your conduct doesn't line up with what it's supposed to, you can go back and say, right here in the Bible it says my eternal life is eternal. Right here in the Bible it says that what God has given me, he's not going to take away from me. Amen. So let's, let's turn one more time. Hebrews 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Here, here's, here's what happens. This, this is what I believe. We're going to turn to Hebrews 10 and 1 Corinthians 3. People in there, and, and, I, and I want to say this kindly because maybe there's just some people who do it innocently and, and, and they haven't been in the Word of God enough to know because, hey, I've, I've been scared to death by Hebrews chapter number 6. And if you don't know Hebrews chapter number 6, I'm not trying to scare you. Amen. I've been scared to death what it says in these next couple of verses in Hebrews chapter number 10 because I, I didn't know. 
But if we, if we, here's, here's what I think has happened. These people who suppose that our salvation is conditional on our abstaining from sin and on our personal righteousness, it's because they've got jumbled up salvation and reward. Because our salvation is only conditioned upon our belief that Jesus died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day. It's a one-time transaction. But the rewards that we can receive from the Lord, they are, they are absolutely conditioned upon our obedience to God's Word. Hebrews chapter number 10 Hebrews chapter number 10 and verse number 19. Hebrews 10 and verse number 19, the Bible says this, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. We can enter into the presence of God, not by our own works, but by the blood of the Lord Jesus, by a new and living way, verse number 20, which He hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, His flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promised, amen, it's not our faithfulness, it's His, verse number 24, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, and what kind of preacher would I be if I didn't read verse number 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching, hallelujah. There we've, we've got, the Bible says that we've got boldness to enter in. We, it's by the blood of Jesus. We've got a high priest. First John calls him our advocate with the Father. We can draw near in full assurance. We have in our possession the sprinkling from an evil conscience. We have, our bodies are washed with the, the pure water. Amen. The Word of God. And so that should result in our encouragement to obey the Lord. You know what happens? Obedience results in blessings. Now, I want to make sure that I'm clear tonight. I'm not saying that obedience results in physical blessings. I'm not saying that obedience results in material blessings. But I will say this. Obedience to God's Word will result in blessings in your walk with God. It absolutely will. Now, let's read verse number 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, comma, not a period, let's read, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fire indignation which shall devour the adversaries. You know what God did? Everything that you committed in your body, every thought that you had, every, every type of, of struggle that you went through that was sinful, before you were saved, when you got saved, God wiped all that off the table. He said, I'm not going to remember it anymore. I'm not going to bring it up anymore. You're not going to give account for those things anymore. And he said, don't worry, I'm going to take care of present sin and future sin as well. You're going to heaven, you've got a ticket there. His name is Jesus Christ. And I don't mean to reduce the Lord down to a ticket, but you get what I mean. But what he tells us here, we've been adopted into the family of God... We can cry, Abba, Father. Why? Because as many as received Him, to them gave you the power to become the sons of God. We are His children. And you know, what, you know what the Father does to disobedient children? Chastisement. When we are disobedient to God, there is punishment. And He says, Everything that happened before you were saved, off the table, not going not gonna to hold it over your head. But when you start living in sin after you're saved, there's going to be some real consequences. Now you, you remember this verse in Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. God, listen, God did not save you to give you a license to sin. Romans 6, 1, Shall we sin that the grace of God may abound? God forbid! He doesn't want Christians to live in iniquity. And, and you aren't. Listen, just because you're saved, you're not going to get away living a wicked life. There's consequences. There's chastisement. Now, 
in the context of this statement, it's not speaking to the temporal consequence of our sin. Because if you sin against God here, you will receive the reward in your body. Amen? You, you, the Bible talks about that. If you sin against God, you are going to incur some damages here. It may not be immediate, but eventually. But what's in view here in this particular passage is not the temporal, but the eternal. Those, listen, God saved you. Not only did He save you, He gave you an opportunity to earn rewards by being obedient to what He said. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that amazing that God would be so kind? Hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save you from your sin. You're not going to hell. I'm going to give you uh, eternal life. And I'm going to give you the Spirit of God to live on the inside to equip you and empower you. And if you will simply live in obedience to me, I'll give you a bunch of rewards. But, but, if you get saved and you live for the devil, you know what's going to happen? All your rewards are going to get burned up. It says here in verse number 27, it says, But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fire indignations which shall devour the adversaries. The same fire that God will use to destroy His enemies is the same fire He's going to try your works by. And if they are not found out, to be the right kind of works, guess what? They're going to be burned up. Hold your place in Hebrews 10. We're coming back. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. You can't, you cannot, if you're saved tonight, you cannot lose it. I don't care if you try to lose it, you can't lose it. But if you don't live for God, the Bible says you're going to suffer loss. Let's read here verse number 11. 1 Corinthians 3, verse number 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Listen, we're to, uh, don't lose your reward. Obey the word of God. Go after the promptings of the Spirit of God. But look what it says here. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. The salvation that God has given is not lost regardless of our conduct, but what we recognize here is that the reward that God has allotted for our obedience can be lost. And He doesn't just say you lose it. He says you suffer loss. It's going to be a big deal. You know why? Because whatever reward God has for you, whatever reward God wants to give you, it's not just something that's going to break 10 minutes after you get it like those dollar store toys. It's going to last for eternity. Now, now, wouldn't you be sad if you get to heaven and God has been dealing with you about a sin in your life? God has been dealing with you about going out and doing something, your calling that God has called you to do, and you don't do it and you keep sinning, and you get to heaven and God said, Hey, I had this reward for you. Let's, let's, just, let's just throw something off the wall. Let's say that reward is the ability to fly. Let's just say that it is. And it's going to last forever. And God said, I, I had this for you. But you lost it. It's burned up. What if, what if God says that I, I had a reward for you to be able to teleport, but you were uh, unwilling to, to break off that fellowship with darkness? So I, I can't give it to you. You're here, you're in heaven, but you're walking. What if the ultimate reward to, to be in the very near presence of Jesus Christ for all eternity, like those seraphim round about His throne crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Amen. I want to be right there beside Him. 
getting to see him, the wounds in his hand, being in his very near... What if, what if at the judgment seat of Christ, you're there, and if you're at the judgment seat of Christ, amen, you're in heaven, you're not, your sins are forgiven, you're not going to hell, amen, that's good. But what if the Lord Jesus looks at you and says, you know, I had a spot for you right here to be beside me in my throne. But you lost it. For all eternity, you could have been in the very near presence of Jesus. But for a temporal pleasure, the Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. But for a temporal disobedience, you didn't want to do what God said or what God called you to do. You're going to lose out on the greatest opportunity you could ever have. And it wasn't just going to last for an hour. It wasn't just going to last for a week. It was going to last forever and ever and ever and ever. That's why God is so serious when He talks about it. Look at, look at this in verse number 29. Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye that he shall be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despot unto the Spirit of grace. You know what? There were some kids that got in trouble at the store. But if I did something, I got in big trouble. You know why? Because I knew better. Whoever this is speaking of, this is speaking of Christians who know the truth about sin and about God's will for their life, and they've rejected it. He said, how much more trouble do you think they're in sinning against light? They've not lost their salvation, but they're in trouble. Verse number 31, it says, or verse number 30, For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We can't lose our salvation because our salvation is not based on our abstaining from sins. Because we can't, we're, we're born in sin, we commit sin. The Bible says the plowing of the wicked is sin. We just, we just, we're real good at sinning. So abstaining from sins is not going to help us maintain our salvation that God had to give us because we couldn't stop sinning. Does that make sense? But our, our, our personal righteousness is not going to allow us to keep our salvation because we aren't righteous in the first place. And our righteousness can't keep our salvation. So we have eternal life and we can know that we know that we know that we know, but what an important reminder to understand that there are rewards at stake. You do not know what God has for you. Wouldn't it be such a sad day to see a big old storehouse of blessings that God had for you and the Lord said, well, i got to light it on fire because you couldn't get any of them because you wouldn't listen to them. God doesn't want you just to live. He doesn't just want you to have eternal... He wants you to have life more abundant. And it comes through obedience. Now, thank God that's not what our salvation depends upon. But remember, remember, next time you think that sin's not that big of a deal, the next time you think, well, I'm saved, it'll be okay, you never know what reward you may be sending away. You never know what gift God was going to give you. You may be disobeying and lose. God wants you to know you have eternal life. And He wants you to take that knowledge and have the courage to continue to believe on Him, that you may obey Him and receive a reward. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we ask tonight, Lord, we want to say thank you. Thank you for the surety that we have in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the anchor of our soul. Lord, the haven of rest. Oh, God, we thank you for the lily of the valley, Lord, the bright morning star, the one who has carried us in his bosom, Lord, the hiding us in the cleft of the rock. Lord, we thank you so much for the salvation you've given us. And Lord, we pray, Father, you'd help us to live in such a way as to earn rewards by obedience. And Lord, that we wouldn't miss out on those things for the temporal offers of this life. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Thank you so much for your attention tonight. 
Hope that you have a wonderful evening. God bless you. You are dismissed.